So Mia, if you um, everyone uh, from um, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I'm Raj Dave, uh, uh, chairman of the C3 course, and I'd like to welcome everyone in uh, our uh, chat room and, and Zoom uh, system, as well as on social media for this very interesting uh, uh, session today with uh, uh, absolutely the world uh, top luminaries in the area of acute coronary syndrome uh, gathered to uh, discuss a very important topic. As you all know, uh, there's been a reduction in, in uh, presentation of acute myocardial infarction during the time of COVID. Uh, so this is a very, very timely uh, discussion about uh, large, especially anterior wall myocardial infarction today. Um, uh, about 850,000 MIs occur uh, every year in the U.S., and 30% of these patients end up having a large MIs and go on to have heart failure. And out of those, 50% uh, of patients have very high mortality risk at four to five uh, years. So anything that we can do to uh, mitigate uh, these large MIs uh, and give patients uh, a better quality of life as well as um, uh, less uh, MI-related complications is always uh, very welcome. So we have an incredible uh, panel here uh, today uh, to uh, discuss this uh, very uh, uh, important topic. Let us in the uh, large anterior wall STEMI, is patent epicardial vessel enough? So um, Dr. Michael Gibson, who is a very um, well-known international uh, cardiologist from Beth Israel Lehi, uh, clinic in Boston, also the keynote speaker of last year's C3 meeting uh, and award recipient there, uh, who is now the CEO of BAME uh, Institute of Clinical Research, as well as professor of medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, he's done a lot of work in the area of acute coronary syndrome uh, and myocardial infarction uh, and a blood uh, score as well as TIMI score. Uh, and he is going to uh, discuss today is infarct size the most important determinant of outcome in primary uh, PCI, what we know from the data. Welcome, Mike, uh, to the session. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time this morning. Thanks, Raj. Should I share my screen here, Raj? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Here we go. Um, can you see my... Can yep. you see my slides? Great. Yes, we do. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Yep. And uh, the answer is yes. I think infarct size is, is really a clinical outcome. There's a lot of debate about whether it's a surrogate or a clinical outcome. I think it is a clinical outcome that matters to patients. We're going to take a walk down memory lane uh, through getting arteries open as you see at the top here, lysing or ballooning and getting the artery open versus restoring myocardial perfusion, which is what really drives a lot of uh, the outcomes. Well, a lot of STEMI care uh, in terms of patency began back in the late 70s with Willie Gans. Uh, the goal was to get the artery open. And it's interesting what's old is new. At that point, they were giving intracoronary streptokinase. And there's three trials now going on giving modern lytics to try and improve tissue perfusion at the end of the case. And of course, we had an era of about 15 years where TIMI grade three flow was king. Uh, getting normal flow was the goal. Uh, the problems were that a lot of us couldn't agree about when that existed. And uh, a lot of the time, normal flow was seen in the right, but not in the LAD. Uh, given how vague it was, I had developed the frame count to count how many frames it took for dye to go down the artery. And it turns out there are a lot of different flavors of Timmy grade three flow. One of the things we learned is that normal flow is 21 frames, but when you look over at the uninvolved artery, it's not normal. It was slowed down by about 40%. So something was going on above and beyond just getting flow down the culprit artery. And of course, in recent years, we've turned our attention away from just looking at the epicardial arteries on the left to looking at the tennis court surface area of microvasculature on the right. Here you can see a hole in the microvasculature where there was a distal embolus or infarction at the apex. And of course, the 
the pathologists knew this. They would inject dye. They would see no dye get into the infarct zone. And we finally woke up to looking at this on angiograms. And here on the left-hand side, you can see perfusion in the back of the heart. But the front of the heart, the LAD territory, is um, not open. I mean, the artery is open, but the myocardium has not been reperfused. And as many of you know, I come with a grading system for this. Our goal really is to restore normal perfusion into the heart muscle, uh, and that is associated with the best outcomes. So even if you have normal blood flow on the top left panel, there is about a seven-fold difference in whether you live or die, depending upon whether you establish myocardial perfusion. So getting arteries open is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We must also restore tissue level perfusion. It turns out this is a little bit of a mystery wrapped in enigma that's a riddle topped in secret sauce. Believe it or not, when you close an artery or include it, when you open it back up, your body responds with the release of adenosine and you get reactive hyperemia. Uh, so faster blood flow may not always uh, be better. Here's an example. You see very rapid blood flow down this LAD. You see a pig in the python kind of stent here. But look distally, look at the apex. You see a stain of the myocardium. You see disruption of the capillary bed. You see capillary leak. And you also see deceleration of dye when you get into the apex. This, this illustrates everything that you can have actually hyperemic flow and a big infarct. Big infarcts may uh, be due to embolization, which you see distally here. Uh, so it's very, very complicated. In fact, faster flow may be associated with higher mortality in about 5,000 angiograms in STEMI. Hyperemia is not good. And it's all very confusing, the epicardial blood flow. We now have other tools to look at the myocardium other than the angiogram, and that's uh, MRI. And when you see a hyper enhancement or a gadolinium gathering there or leaking, that's bad. Uh, and what's interesting is that gadolinium uh, enhancement matches up with the uh, bad perfusion that we see on the angiogram. But it's a much more quantitative tool uh, of looking at this. And uh, Greg uh, sent me over this slide, which is quite good. I had it in not as good of a format as Greg has it in here. That microvascular obstruction that you see on an MRI, where you don't achieve tissue perfusion, is quite a good predictor of outcomes. Uh, the worse the myocardiovascular obstruction, the worse the survival. And what's no surprise is that the obstruction of the microvasculature on the left is correlated with the size of the infarct. So uh, I think there's probably a little bit of bidirectional uh, causality here. Probably microvascular uh, infarcts cause big infarcts, of course, but um, once you have that edema and swelling, uh, you know, that bad swelling of the myocardium also causes bad blood flow uh, on the uh, angiogram. And not, uh, you know, what's interesting is uh, that infarct size, of course, we know is associated with mortality. Uh, this is uh, data from Greg, where he did a patient level pulled analysis of 10 trials, the biggest look at this issue. And it's very clear and it makes perfect sense. The bigger the infarct, the bigger the infarct zone, uh, the worse uh, the mortality. And not only mortality, but we have more walking wounded. When you have a big infarct, you have more hospitalization or heart failure. And this is a big, big economic driver. Uh, people coming back in the hospital, that really costs a lot of money. Heart failure is a very expensive disease to manage. So when people talk about, well, we really should just look at mortality, not infarct size. I would also point out that infarct size causes bad clinical 
and economic morbidity as well. And we need to pay attention to that as an endpoint. And then when you put it all together, uh, when you look at infarct size and that obstruction of the heart muscle on MRI, that myocardiovascular obstruction, they are both independently associated with mortality. So it's the size of the infarct, but there's also something going on uh, aside from just the infarct size. We've done some looking at this, not just the size of the infarct, but the complexity of this infarct. And complexity is something that's interesting uh, to talk about mathematically. I like to think of it as when someone says, how long is the coast of Maine? Well, it depends upon how long your ruler is. If you have a big, big ruler, it's not very long, but if you go in and out of every little crevice, it's much, much longer. So in our MRI core lab, we have uh, looked at planimetered in and out of the infarct to measure uh, the coast of Maine approach and compared that to kind of as the crow flies. And what we find is this, bad perfusion means more complex scars on top of bigger scars. So uh, you can have uh, the same size of scar, but you can have a more complex scar uh, with poor outcomes. Why is complexity important? It's, com it's important because arrhythmogenesis is related to the amount of dead tissue against living tissue. And if you have a longer perimeter, you have more myocardium abutting uh, that's dead, abutting living tissue. And that may be a greater zone for arrhythmogenesis. And sure enough, what we've found in the past is that bad perfusion is related to arrhythmogenesis, not flow, not epicardial flow, but myocardial perfusion is related to subsequent VTVF, even on the right-hand side here, even if you have preservation of uh, infarct size. So Bill, Greg, myself, and others have taken a walk down memory lane here. The first goal was to get the heart muscle open early on, but then when you look distally in the bed, you see we failed to get the muscle open. We now have good tools, as you see on the upper right-hand side, this wide area to measure how big the infarct is, uh, but also look at the black areas within that. There may be some viability zones or hemorrhage. We've now moved to beyond just looking at the size of the infarct and look at how serrated it is and complex it is. And we're also now looking at, are there islands of viability within the infarct? I do think this, an open artery is necessary, but it's not enough. We must restore myocardial perfusion to limit infarct size, arrhythmogenesis, and heart failure and mortality. Um, better perfusion means preservation of muscle, and it improves both the size of the infarct and the complexity of the scar. Now, I think there is ongoing debate about whether infarct size is a surrogate or is it an endpoint in and of itself. Personally, I think at this point in time in cardiology, we need to view infarct size more as a endpoint in and of itself. Uh, perhaps mortality and all that can be looked at at post-marketing studies. Uh, but I do think infarct size, like the size of a tumor in cancer, is a very important endpoint and we should really consider looking at that. And I'm speaking more from a regulatory point of view at this point. Well, thanks for letting me talk about this, uh, Raj, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for uh, that very insightful presentation. Any comments from the panel members? Any questions? As well, Dan, I couldn't agree more. The, the, the big issue about universal acceptance of this is really struggling with that definition that you talked about, Mike. And whenever you deal with surrogates, you're always going to get that criticism that it's not the real deal, but uh, eventually, no one argues with mortality, and we'll just have to someday have to do a mortality study. But I'm totally convinced that you're right about that. It's a very legitimate endpoint, and it correlates directly with survival. 
Yeah, I would agree. And uh, Mike, I, I congratulate you on continuing to take this to the next level. I think your work in press about showing, uh, you know, increased arrhythmogenesis in patients with complex star, scar independent of epicardial coronary flow um, and increased with decreased uh, microvascular flow is, is really fascinating and important. I mean, ultimately, if you look at the early days of primary PCI versus TPA um, and other lytic therapy, uh, um, the improved mortality with primary PCI correlated with reduced infarct size. And that was shown nicely by, by Shomig and others. And so I think when you talk about this being an endpoint, our goal is to try to make as small an infarct as possible. And I think that's the easiest thing to measure, especially with CMR. We're very good at that right now. Uh, and if you do have a, we also did additional studies that showed that it was a actual surrogate in that within those randomized trials, if you reduced it, that also correlated with reduced mortality. So I think that it's one of, it's not a clinical endpoint, but it's probably one of the strongest endpoints that we do have uh, when we're you know, looking for newer therapies. We don't wanna do 3,000, 5,000 patient trials, which is what's required in non-shock um, uh, studies to see reductions in mortality. And I think you've pulled it together beautifully. Thanks, Mark, I think you did a, a wonderful job of reviewing uh, the heterogeneous zone of dispersion of electrical signals, I think is absolutely essential in terms of the long-term arrhythmogenesis. Uh, when, <clears throat> when we do alcohol septal ablations of the first septal perforator with alcohol, you get a very circumscribed, uh, almost like a surgical scar uh, with, with little heterogeneous zones. And, and there really has never been any demonstration that, that alcohol ablation, which is an infarct, uh, causes any long-term deleterious effects. So I think it's not only the size, but also sort of this, the breadth of the zone that is going to be important determining outcome. I would agree with you that infarct size now is measured by CMR, uh, should be listed as, as a primary endpoint because there's reams of data now showing that uh, the bigger the infarct, the more likely the ventricle will expand, adversely remodel, and then ultimately uh, cause heart failure or mortality. Yeah. Just to build on what you said, Bill, we do in the um, HOCAM world, we've analyzed about 2,000 HOCAM MRIs, and we've shown it's the heterogeneity uh, in the HOCAM, uh, you know, that is arrhythmogenic. Uh, and um, so it's fascinating. It's, it's a very, very, very interesting field, the MRI and arrhythmogenesis area. There is a one question uh, from the audience from Dr. Pradeep Kumar. Uh, do drugs with coronary vasodilator properties help? Well, I, I, I mean, as much as I'd like to say yes, I hate to say it, but there haven't been any real good studies showing improved outcomes with the drugs. You know, I showed you that angiogram where you had hyperemic flow. It looks great. The angiogram looks great. The, the epicardial blood flow looks great, but the outcome's poor. Um, I think the endogenous release of adenosine really confuses us. And um, frankly, I, I hate to say this, I don't want to be a nihilist and maybe Greg will pull me back. But, you know, when we give these drugs, we're making flow look better. We're making it look better for a transient period of time. Uh, but I don't know if that flow is getting into the infarct zone that's damaged. And I don't know of many studies that show any durable improvements and outcomes from those drugs. You know, I'd, I'd agree with you, Mike. And in fact, there's in vitro data that what those, what those drugs do, whether it's adenosine or nitroprusside or, or calcium channel blockers, they actually increase flow into the non-infarct zone. Exactly. So they may cause steel. They may cause steel. And they may cause steel. So, but they don't increase flow into the infarct zone. And if you've got an obstructed microcirculation, whether because of just edema and necrosis or because of distal thromboemboli, you know, uh, you're not going to improve that with vasodilators. So I think the, that edema, the edema may be a big part of it, Craig. I mean, I think we may need better approaches to reducing edema. Time is our best ally in doing that, but uh, agree. Okay, we'll ask one more uh, quick question and then we will move forward. Uh, Dr. Fahim Jeffrey uh, for Dr. Gibson, if scar heterogeneity seen after primary PCI likely related to recurrent embolization uh, during the process of balloon angioplasty, then stinting, Intuitively, small balloon POBA first, then delayed stenting a few days later should be beneficial, but the trials haven't shown it. Can you speculate why that's the case? Well, I don't know. I don't know why there's necessarily why there's heterogeneity. Uh, I tend to favor 
direct stenting, um, which several meta-analyses have now shown is associated with better outcomes. And I've written papers showing that direct stenting with less embolization improves tissue perfusion and improves heart failure. Um, I think you see a very heterogeneous application of direct stenting around the country and the world, but I can't tell you exactly why uh, there's that uh, heterogeneity. Maybe it is a showering of emboli. I'm not sure. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, so now we'll continue with the, uh, with the program. And now it's my great uh, honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Greg Stone, who was supposed to be the Lifetime Career Achievement Award winner for C3 in 2020. Unfortunately, we haven't had the meeting. So Greg will be the award winner for 2021. Uh, he's uh, currently the Director of Academic Affairs uh, for Mount Sinai uh, Health System. He's a Professor of Medicine as well as Co-Director of Medical uh, Research and Education at uh, Cardiovascular Research Foundation. Uh, and he's going to now talk about a solution to this problem, uh, one of the solutions, uh, about supersaturated oxygen and acute enteral MI. Uh, what have we learned from IC Hot? and Amy Hart uh, studies. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Raj. And I'm, uh, I'm honored to um, receive the award. Uh, what it shows is that life is passing me by in the COVID era, and that's okay. Hopefully I can catch up to it next year. So are you seeing my screen now? I can see your screen perfect. We can hear you great, and we can see your slides great. Beautiful. So I'll talk about supersaturated oxygen therapy. Uh, these are my disclosures. So you just heard um, beautifully from Mike what the problem is. And the reality is, is we've gotten very good at restoring epicardial coronary flow with primary PCI. Probably in 85 to 90% of the times we get TIMI-3 flow. But despite that, we often uh, don't recover left ventricular function very effectively. And you know, this has been frustrating me for 30 years. And I'm sure Bill and others uh, that have been doing primary PCI for a long time feel the same way. So this is an example of what we deal with. This is a 49-year-old man who presented with crushing chest pain for 90 minutes. And baseline, you can see a total thrombotic occlusion of the proximal LED. And this is his acute left ventriculogram before the arteries open. And you can see total akinesis and slight dyskinesis of the anterior wall apex and distal inferior wall. So we perform primary PCI and put a stent in and we get a great result, Timmy 3 flow. Okay, well, we can talk another time whether it's actually myocardial blush here, but it's TIMI3 flow, and the SD segments came down pretty well. And in fact, 13 months later, he was in a study and came back for a control angiogram. And here's Mike's pig in the python, and you can see we've got a beautifully patent artery, no restenosis, and TIMI3 flow. And again, to remind you, this was his acute left ventriculogram, and now this is his left ventriculogram at 13 months later. Okay. And despite this, his door to balloon time was 67 minutes. He presented in 90 minutes. So we're about two and a half times from symptom onset to uh, reperfusion. And we get absolutely no recovery in left ventricular function. And this patient had NYHA class two heart failure. So one potential approach to this that we're very excited about, and as you'll see, represents the first FDA approved approach is supersaturated oxygen therapy. And this basically replicates what happens in a hyperbaric chamber uh, where you uh, increase pressure and it increases uh, tissue perfusion of hyperoxemic blood and it increases wound healing. So what this happens here is that you take the patient's own blood um, out from the femoral artery, you put it into a mixing chamber, it gets super saturated with oxygen. So the blood basically ends up with 760 to 1000 millimeters of mercury and then you infuse it back into the heart, into the myocardial infarct zone. And this occurs after PCI. Now, initially this was done with an infusion catheter, usually a tracker catheter directly into the LAD. So for example, there's the LAD stent, you put the tracker um, or the company Therox came up with their own catheter, a little smaller called the Inca-1, and you'd put it right before the uh, stent and it would infuse for 90 minutes into the LAD. And again, after PCI, so it doesn't delay reperfusion. And Richard Spears in particular uh, gets a huge amount of credit for developing most of what we know uh, preclinically with uh, this technique. And he and others did a series of porcine models 
60 minute balloon occlusions followed by 90 minutes of intracoronary infusion of hyperoxemic blood. And you would see in the control uh, pigs, you'd get large transmural infarcts. And in the um, uh, uh, SSO2 treated animals, you get almost no infarction whatsoever, perhaps just a very small subendocardial rim of infarction. Histologically, it appeared that one of the major mechanisms of action was um, once the artery is open, of course, you can get reperfusion injury, but you also have very edematous um, uh, endothelium, and that can lead to capillary um, uh, constriction, and that's one of the ways that we get microvascular obstruction, where you can have an open epicardial coronary, but very little blood flow into the microcirculation. And with supersaturated oxygen, um, uh, uh, this was from a study from Antonio Bartarelli, um, he routinely saw that the endothelial cells were much smaller. Uh, they were, really looked normal, and the capillaries were not constricted and were much more open. There's other mechanisms that have been developed, including activation of cardioprotective reflexes, um, a reduction in free radical generation, et cetera. So when you looked here um, in these preclinical miles, uh, models, there was increased myocardial blood flow with supersaturated oxygen, better ST segment resolution, fewer PVCs, better LVEF as early as two hours, pathologically reduced infarct size, less hemorrhage, less myeloperoxidase levels, and other um, bad actors. So you could see here, for example, uh, infarct size um, in control and animals. And it seemed from the early studies that this would work if you even did it up to 24 hours post-reperfusion. So here you can see was infarct size in control animals, similar area at risk, and infarct size um, with even 24 hours after reperfusion seemed to be about a 50% reduction. So this was then tested in uh, patients in the AMIHOT-1 trial, and Bill O'Neill led this, and so his comments will be pertinent during the discussion. And this was a 269 patient trial with both anterior and large inferior infarcts with reduced TIMI flow at baseline undergoing primary rescue PCI within 24 hours from symptom onset. So we often think that within you know, two to three hours, you, if you're going to get a transmural infarct, you may get a it may be done. It, it's over. Um, although we know that coronary um, occlusion can be a very dynamic process in patients, sub, and different patients have different myocardial oxygen demands, and the artery can be opening and closing. So that can be prolonged. But as you saw, it seemed that SSO2 might work for up to 24 hours or even longer. So they included patients up to 24 hours. And they had a successful PCI, and then they randomized them to 90 minutes of intracoronary supersaturated oxygen versus control. And this is what the console looked like. This is the mixing chamber. And again, they used a tracker catheter. And there were three co-primary endpoints um, in this randomized trial. And unfortunately, this was a negative trial. You can see there was no difference in infarct size at 14 days. Um, there was no difference in the overall ST segment um, uh, uh, resolution between zero and three hours. They looked at the area under the curve, no difference, and uh, there was no difference in echocardiographic regional wall motion improvement from baseline to three months. But when they looked at a subset of patients in a post hoc analysis that um, most people in retrospect would say, well, this is probably the sweet spot for any um, uh, infarct size reducing therapy, that is the big infarcts, the anterior infarcts, and those reperfused relatively early within six hours. So perhaps you may not have a total transmural infarct and you may have a chance of recovery. Here you can see the infarcts were large, about 23% of the left ventricle, and they were reduced to 9% of the left ventricle with SSO2. The ST segment resolution was better, and the improvement in regional wall motion score index was also improved. Now, all of these, again, this is only 105 of the um, uh, 269 patients, post hoc analysis, uh, borderline p value. So, this is all hypothesis generated. So, we therefore ran the AMIHOT 2 trial. And this was a trial now following this hypothesis of 304 patients with only anterior infarcts with reduced TIMI flow, reperfused by PCI with stenting within six hours. So, it basically tested that um, hypothesis. Uh, you could have TIMI two or three flow after the procedure, and then they were randomized to standard therapy versus SSO2. And we had two primary endpoints, um, either infarct size, powered for superiority, using technetium 99 spec at 14 days, or an, and safety, a 30-day MACE non-inferior endpoint. 
Now this was done in a very complex Bayesian framework um, to keep the sample size relatively low for a startup company where we actually borrowed similar data from the AmiHot one trial. But this is all very validated, complex statistics, but very validated and FDA actually promotes this type of Bayesian analysis to make more efficient clinical trials. So this was the primary efficacy endpoint, the pooled um, infarct size by Technici Sestamibi, total 302 patients with anterior infarcts. And you can see um, overall the infarct size was about 25% of the left ventricle with control, reduced to 18.5% with supersaturated oxygen. That was a difference of the medians of 6.5% um, by a classic um, a Wilcoxon non-parametric test that was positive, but more importantly, by, by Bayesian posterior probability, it was 96.9%, which surpassed the 95% requirement to be quite certain that this is a real difference. Now, 6.5% difference in infarct size is clinically meaningful. Uh, this has been consistent with about a 23% reduction in six-month mortality um, from prior lytic trials and about a 25% reduction in one-year mortality from some of our primary PCI trials. What about the safety endpoint? Overall, we met the primary safety endpoint. The overall MACE rate was 3.8% with control, 5.4% with supersaturated oxygen, and you can see the Bayesian posterior probability of non-inferiority was 99.5%. Unfortunately, though, when this device therefore went for panel for approval, it was not approved. And that's because there were some safety concerns. We did have, because of the need for a larger sheath or actually a second sheath to be able to pull out the blood from the femoral artery to oxygenate, we tended to have more access site adverse um, events, particularly hematomas. We had um, increased bleeding um, and um, uh, trend towards increased transfusions. The baseline hemoglobins were lower. And while there was no difference in stem thrombosis or death, the um, very low frequency events were going in the wrong direction. 2.5% in control versus 4.1% in supersaturated oxygen uh, for stent thrombosis. And this was a concern because the tracker catheter is close to the stent and perhaps actually could you know, damage the stent, abut the stent, um, or who knows what effects the oxygen was having on platelet activation. So this was a concern. And the deaths were um, zero versus 1.8%. Now, we argue that 0% in large anterior infarcts, that's just kind of luck. That's amazing. You've never been seen before. 1.8% is very, very low. And these p-values are not close to statistical significance. But still, the panel wanted more data, and the FDA was concerned. So this led to the development of the so-called optimized supersaturated oxygen therapy approach. And here, basically, in a much more futuristic-looking console, we pull blood from the sheath. But now, instead of putting it through an infusion catheter into the LAD, we infuse it through a diagnostic five French catheter right at the origin of the left main coronary artery. And it infuses the entire um, uh, um, left coronary system. And perhaps that will have some benefits. As Mike mentioned, flow is actually reduced in um, non-infarct arteries as well as infarct arteries. So perhaps this will um, promote some intracoronary collaterals. We don't know. But we didn't think it was going to hurt. Um, and the, the overall flow rate was increased. And so the overall infusion duration was decreased from 90 minutes to 60 minutes, which makes it easier to uh, infuse in a post-infarct setting. So again, the old way, a guide catheter with an infusion catheter abutting the stent, the new way, um, just a diagnostic catheter at the origin of the left coronary and 60 minutes instead of 90 minute infusion. So we tested the safety of this primarily in what was called the Icy Hot um, FDA approval IDE study. And FDA wasn't concerned about the uh, infarct size reduction. They were convinced that this worked in that regard, but they wanted to see that this therapy could be safe. And so uh, we did a 100 patient single arm registry and anterior STEMIs, uh, successful standing within six hours, 60 minute of SSO2 delivered within the left main coronary, and then looked at follow-up. And we had exploratory MRI analyses at four days and at 30 days. And we met the overall um, NACE endpoint, which had to be less than a performance goal of 10.7%. In these patients, we had a 7.1% NACE rate. And importantly, we had no deaths. 
We had only one reinfarction and one stent thrombosis, which seemed to be due to an edge dissection of the stent, not related to the SSO2. <coughs> that was the only TVR um, within the 30 days, and only one of these patients developed a heart failure. The overall target lesion failure rate in these large anterior MIs was again at 30 days, very low at 1%. No patients had myocardial rupture, which had been present in two of the prior patients from AMIHOT2. So this was clearly a safe procedure from this experience. Now looking at exploratory um, evidence, just about MRI, do we still seem like we have consistent MRI results? These are the overall results of the four day MRI and the 30 day MRI. You can see the infarct mass will always decrease with uh, duration and that's because edema primarily resolves over time. Uh, this probably stabilizes at about six months. Microvascular obstruction, of no microvascular obstruction was present in about 45% of patients, and in the patients to whom it was present, it seemed to be very, very low. Here you can see ejection fractions, 43% at four days and 45% at 30 days. So we compared the, um, uh, the four-day MRI with icy hot, the 30-day MRI with icy hot, to the AMIHOT2 14-day Technetium 99 SPECT. And SPECT and MRI have the similar um, uh, median infarct sizes. The difference in uh, SPECT versus MRI is that MRI is capable of picking up smaller subendocardial infarcts, but the medians um, are very similar. And here you can see we expect this to decrease over time, and we're going from 24%, 20%, 19.4%. So it seems like we're very similar to what we should have been um, uh, that we they probably did not lose efficacy in terms of infarct size reduction. And then finally, if you look at the outcomes of one year, we actually had a 0% rate of death or nuance at heart failure hospitalization. Those would be the uh, two endpoints that you would expect would be affected by infarct size reduction the most. And to try to get a sense of, of how that compares, uh, with a relatively contemporary population. We did a propensity score matched analysis in uh, 83 pairs of patients with, uh, uh, from the Infuse AMI trial, and death or new onset heart failure hospitalization was 12%. So this was a significant reduction. And you can see there was a reduction in death, reduction in heart failure hospitalization, no differences in reinfarction or target vessel revascularization. So, you know, that's kind of a falsification hypothesis. You wouldn't expect that but we did see in this propensity score adjusted analysis, less death and less heart failure hospitalization. So as a result, um, on April 2nd of last year, the FDA approved supersaturated oxygen therapy for the treatment of patients with anterior myocardial infarction undergoing primary PCI within six hours of symptom onset with this new optimized system. So basically you do your PCI, you don't have to do anything else, um, uh, you get a successful result, you put a diagnostic catheter in the left main, and then infuse the SSO2 for 60 minutes, and you're done. So in summary, supersaturated oxygen is the first FDA-approved cardioprotective therapy demonstrated to reduce infarct size in a pivotal, powered, randomized trial. Importantly, supersaturated oxygen is delivered post-PCI, thus not interfering with rapid reperfusion. And compared to a 90-minute intracoronary infusion, 60 minutes of supersaturated oxygen delivered to the left main via diagnostic catheter offers a safer and simpler approach to reducing infarct size in patients with anterior MI. So FDA has um, asked us to do a post-approval randomized trial uh, just to get more data on safety and effectiveness, and we are in the final planning stages of that, and that will be starting uh, later this year. Thanks very much, and I will conclude. Hey. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Greg, uh, for uh, those, this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I'll open it up to the panel for any comments uh, about uh, uh, Greg's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, then we have a few questions from the audience, and I'll, I'll ask those. Uh, Dr. Schatz, your uh, mic is uh, on the mute, so if you can right. unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, I wanted to mention to um, Greg, great presentation, as always. The, the way we do infarct size evaluation, is, I love an MRI because it's so sensitive and so accurate for quantitative assessment. But the way we do it at four days really underestimates the improvement with SSO2. It's impossible to get an MRI at the time of the infarct, but a lot of healing takes place between day zero and day four. And 
I wonder what if it was possible to do an MRI even earlier, if that would change things. So the ejection fraction certainly changes from day zero at baseline to day four. So if you're taking your baseline at day four or five, I think it's going to underestimate the impact and the value of SSO2. I think it would actually be a bigger delta if you could get that uh, ejection fraction or infarct size early. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, that, that certainly is possible. What, what complicates this is that early on, though, uh, you know, within the first 30 days, you're actually measuring in addition to the actually in infarct tissue itself, you're also measuring a lot of edema. And the earlier you go, the more tissue edema there is. And so in some regards, some people would say uh, the opposite. And they say, well, we shouldn't really wait, measure infarct size until six months or a year. Then we really get scar. And then we can see how big the difference in scar is between the technique. Uh, but um, I do think that the edema, as Mike mentioned, also has deleterious, deleterious early effects. So it's nice to get both an early snapshot and a late snapshot. And mm -hmm. in that regard, earlier the better. We usually do somewhere between two and seven days or three to five days for the early MRI. Um, logistically, you know, obviously within 24 hours, most people don't want to sit in an MRI scanner. Yeah, it's a problem. But ejection fraction, I think everyone would agree. There's a lot of improvement that takes place in those first few days that I, I personally have seen that the SSO2 com compared to control seems to get a bigger bang early on. So there is one question uh, from the audience about, uh, uh, do you um, uh, also use this therapy in patients who have presented beyond six hours with anterior MI? Sure, so, so right now I would suggest you don't do that. Uh, we don't have evidence that that works. That would be a great follow-up study. Uh, we also, you know, don't have evidence in cardiogenic shock, but we're very excited about applying this potentially to patients in cardiogenic shock. Um, you know, as you saw from Bill's AMIHOT-1 trial, at least the later uh, presenting patients um, uh, did not seem to derive as much benefit or any benefit. So right now, the current evidence is within six hours. Dr. Hari uh, from Jordan, um, uh, can Dr. Stone describe how to technically infuse SSO2? Uh, sure, it's actually really relatively simple. Um, there is, you know, you have the sheath in the patient and it requires at least a six French sheath. And when the procedure is over, the blood gets drawn from the side port of the sheath into the mixing chamber and then gets connected to the diagnostic catheter and gets infused directly into the left main. So of course, if you get involved in uh, um, delivering this therapy, the company representative would come out and be with you in your first few cases and teach you exactly how to do this. Obviously, you've gotta be very careful to not infuse air, uh, et cetera, but it, it's really not a complicated procedure. Dr. Rangaseli from uh, Texas, would you do SSO2 therapy post-PCI-EF uh, appears normal and a patient uh, appears to have normal wall motion? That's a great question. Um, we actually looked at that in AMIHOT2, and by far the biggest bang for the buck is in those patients with um, uh, abnormal left ventricular ejection fraction. The patients that had an ejection fraction of less than 40% in AMIHOT2 had a marked reduction in infarct size and a marked improvement in ejection fraction. The patients that had an injection fraction of 40 to 50 percent um, or above 40 percent had a similar relative improvement, but obviously the absolute improvement was much, much less. So if I was resource constrained, I would certainly um, save it for the patients who had the big acute infarcts. Now, you know, Bill and I are old school. We, we like performing acute left ventricular grams in primary PCI. A lot of people don't like to do that either because of the contrast. I still think it's personally, I think it's very useful and worth 30 cc's of dye. Um, but I suppose if you had a very good echo, you could use the echo um, uh, uh, left ventricular function to be able to make that decision. But you really have to make the decision right there on the table. Uh, the time to give it is right after the successful PCI. Okay, great, Greg. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, let's uh, continue with the, the session. Uh, now it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Bill O'Neill, uh, also a previous uh, award winner of uh, C3. Uh, 
an internationally recognized uh, leader in international cardiology from uh, Henry Ford uh, Health System, who has been pioneer uh, in uh, use of angioplasty for treatment of heart attacks, uh, and was also the principal investigator for the Emmy Heart Study. And today, uh, uh, we have given him the charge to uh, discuss supersaturated oxygen, uh, future clinical trials, and its rationales. Thank you very much, Raj. Uh, can you see my slides? I can see you. Uh, I have not. Click I don't on, Click on share screen, Bill. I did. Let me try again. Any luck? Are your slides open? Yeah. Uh, can you see those now? No, we don't. Hmm. Once you click share screen, does it bring up another window where you then have to click OK? Share, yeah. There we are. There we go. Okay. We, see, we see it now. OK, wonderful. So uh, thank you very much, Raj, for inviting me to this uh, great uh, uh, session. Uh, it's impossible to follow Greg and say very much that's new about uh, supersaturated oxygen and he really did a fantastic job. I was sort of flagging at the very end of a relay and sort of just turned over the baton to Greg and he's kind of carried to the finish line. So I want to congratulate him and I also want to uh, thank Richard Schatz and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Spears. Uh, Dr. Spears has been like the, the pioneer and the guru of this. I've known him for over a quarter of a century, and it's just been an honor to participate with the, in these trials with him. Um, if I go forward now, so let me just see if I can go forward on my slides. Okay, so let me just. Can you see my slides? Okay, or not? Yeah. Yep, we can see. You know, so if you just go in a normal. Yep, I got it. Yep, we see just fine. Yep. So, um, so. When we talk about decrease infarct size, we have to kind of go back to the basics. A long, long time ago, uh, Reimer and Jennings at Duke uh, did animal reperfusion studies. Uh, and you can see that within about 40 minutes of onset of symptoms, there's a, there's a, a onset of cornea occlusion, there's a subendocardial infarct, and then within about three hours of more transmural and 96 hours. Uh, and this, this, I think, is probably any of the slides that you want to remember is kind of the key to all of this infarct size reduction. Uh, there's very few people we reperfuse within 90, within 40 minutes, uh, but there's a lot of people that we, we, we are reperfusing within three hours. And, uh, and, and so there is a, a mechanism by accelerating infarct and all of the efforts at door to balloon and rapid, uh, you know, triage is really related to this, that you really wanna to try to get these patients very, very quickly. In the later hours, uh, it's really unlikely that time is really gonna be that dependent. And so we wanted to see if there's any way to expand this sort of time window because only a very few percentage of patients actually come in within these very, very early uh, time of onset of infarcts. And that was really what led us to really try to want, want to work with uh, Therox. Uh, and, and initially I wanna thank again, uh, Richard for allowing us to participate in this. We did the first uh, um, human trials in US and anterior infarction when I was at Bowman and Richard was at Wayne State. And uh, then this subsequently led to this entire field. The whole idea is you have a hyperbaric chamber and you actually, you, you'd like to be able to put a patient in it, but obviously you can't. And so is there any way of getting hyperbaric oxygen to the, to the myocardium? And, and, and the, the field has just been absolutely unbelievable to watch how this has developed uh, from using eight and nine French catheters to doing and putting in a, a, a catheter into the coronary and infusing it subselectively. All those decisions really were made in an enormous amount of uh, research constraint. And I would say that, uh, that because of this, many of the studies that have been done have been done by small startup companies. And I really, I, again, want to compliment uh, Kevin Larkin at Therox, who ultimately led this uh, to a completion by having the, the, the company bought by Zoll. And now with a major corporation involved, I think there will be some heft and more uh, uh, larger volume and more definitive clinical trials uh, will, will happen. Um, so if I could go to the next slide. So um, when we did the PAMI trial with Greg and Cindy and I, we looked at the outcome of patients with primary PCI that were treated. And you can see that, uh, that patients that had uh, high risk, these are anterior MIs, or uh, patient, older patients, patients aged greater than 70, 
uh, they had a significant uh, improvement in, in death or reinfarction. However, the low risk patients, and these are patients with primarily with inferior infarction, uh, had a very low mortality. And, and so even 25 years ago, we recognized that when we did primary PCI, the mortality was markedly dif different between anterior and non-anterior infarction. And so we were doing very well. If, if you recall the, the, the later trials, the Cadillac trials and others, uh, horizons, uh, they were getting overall mortality rate in STEMI of less than 2%. And so using mortality as an endpoint uh, is going to be very difficult. However, uh, in the larger groups of patients, and this is typified by uh, cardiogenic shock, where we still have a mortality of 50%. So if we're going to be looking at agents to decrease infarct size and improve overall outcome, it's going to be related to, um, uh, it's going to, be related to decrease in infarct size. Uh, we looked at this over 10 years, multiple trials trying to decrease infarct size. And what we found is that there's an enormous time dependency for anterior MIs. So, so overall, anterior MIs end up with, with much larger infarcts than inferior MIs. Uh, but more importantly, there is a time dependency. So within, within uh, uh, zero to, nine, to 120 minutes, there's a, almost a linear relationship uh, to, to infarct um, sizes. And whereas with, with inferior MIs, they end up being very small and there's very little time dependency, which is really interesting. It's probably because the right coronary has collaterals from the LAD and the circumflex, whereas the LAD primarily only has collaterals from one coronary bed. So regardless, you can see that, that this is kind of where the action is. And if we are going to use time dependence, you, you're gonna to wanna to try to get these anterior MIs reperfused very quickly. In spite of that, even when they are reperfused very quickly, they end up with, with larger infarcts. So this is a patient that we treated when I was in the University of Miami, a patient that came in with a right coronary occlusion. Uh, we opened up the LAD, we, I'm sorry, we opened up the, the right coronary, we placed a stent. Uh, the, the collaterals now, the right ventricular marginal branches were open and this patient did well. And, and numerous trials now have shown that these patients actually don't even need to be uh, hospitalized in an intensive care unit. Uh, now that we're having these patients coming in in the COVID area, I, I, my guess is that we're going to see a lot more RV infarctions and a lot more very, very sick uh, patients with right coronary occlusion. But largely, when the patients come in with a, within a good time frame, these patients do extraordinarily well, and there's really not very much more that we need to do for them. However, in patients that have a, an, an anterior infarction, so they come in uh, with, a, with, with, a, with a large infarcts, and you saw beautifully on the angiogram that Greg showed this massive infarct with anteroapical hypokinesis and dyskinesis. And then the infarct expansion occurs. And over about three months, it, the, the ventricle adversely remodels the, the left ventricular end diastolic and end systolic uh, um, dimensions increase. The patients then start developing mitral regurgitation. And this then ends up being for a subsequent massive uh, utilization of, of healthcare resources. Uh, the patients may end up needing uh, uh, heart transplants in the future. Uh, more, more likely will need left ventricular assist support devices. Uh, they, they will need uh, uh, implantable defibrillators and they'll be bring, coming into the hospital with recurrent episodes of congestive heart failure. Uh, right now in the United States there are about a million admissions for uh, refractory recurrent heart failure. So this is a massive problem and unfortunately it's going to be actually further worsened because of the fact that we're actually keeping these patients alive with primary PCI. So, so this is a slide that, that came from Cloner uh, that kind of keeps me up a, 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 like as if a priest would wonder whether or not there is a God. Uh, can we really in decrease infarct size? So this is scanning electromicrograms. This is what a normal, uh, what a normal um, myocardial muscle looks like. At 20 minutes, there's now edema, and then by 40 minutes, there's really pretty much irreversible damage. So, so this is really the question. Uh, we're going to have problems decreasing infarct size in 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 a lot of central necrotic areas, and there's just such a strong time dependency that irrespective of how quickly we get the patients to the cath lab, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of patients that have myocardial damage. Um, we've talked and, 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 and uh, uh, Dr. Gibson did a phenomenal job of reviewing all of the data on epicardial reperfusion. Uh, and we've tried combination therapy, uh, epicardial reperfusion, I think we've gotten as far as we're going to, we're getting 95, 96% rates of TME3 flow. Uh, more importantly, people have looked at all of these kinds of uh, 
ag agonist to try to decrease infarct size by microcirculatory uh, reperfusion. I think that adenosine is still probably one agent that, that may be of value, but all these other things have been used. And, and I think that this is kind of where the field is headed. Uh, can we increase uh, uh, salvage? The only thing that actually has been consistently proven, as Greg suggests, uh, that is FDA approved, is a supersaturated oxygen. So as we sit here today in 2020, what have I got that I can use in the cath lab today to decrease infarct size? And it's primarily supersaturated oxygen. Um, if we, and why, why would that happen? Uh, we know that ischemia in myocyte death is related either to um, uh, energy depletion, and this is in the central necrotic zone. There's an irreversible loss of transmembrane gradients in myocardial, mitochondrial death. And, and, and then the, the, the membrane ruptures, there's calcium efflux, and then the, 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 the cell dies. And this is really the area that, that I don't think we can do very much about. Uh, there is, however, reperfusion injury, and, and this is where we think a lot of the advantage comes with supersaturated oxygen. In addition to less cellular edema, there actually probably is less reperfusion injury, and I think that this is almost the first proof of concept that we can do something about reperfusion injury. We've tried to decrease uh, apoptosis and apoptotic cell death, and there really hasn't been any uh, data from any trials uh, that have allowed us to demonstrate that we could decrease uh, cell death by decreasing apoptotic cell death. Uh, one interesting area that, that is interesting that I think we has been largely ignored is remote, is remote ischemic preconditioning. And so if you pre precondition by doing a five minute occlusion and then release, uh, there is evidence from signaling that you can get a systemic pr protection. Uh, and in particular, there was a large study that was done with 330 uh, patients. There was an outpatient ambulance, uh, they took the patient to the cath lab and they found that there was a significant reduction of, of infarct size uh, in terms of LV salvage. Um, the, problem, the problem with this approach is that I don't know if you have, any of you have tried doing these occlusions. We actually tried, we did a trial to try to decrease um, uh, contrast nephropathy and after about five base patients we really stopped it because uh, try to put a blood pressure cuff on your arm and leave it up for five minutes. It's actually incredibly painful. Uh, I could only stand it for about three minutes before I had to have it released. So I think that's really uh, one problem. Uh, if they could figure that out, I think it, it might be of benefit, but it, it's one area that I think still probably needs to be evaluated a little bit further. Uh, we, we've done a lot of work with, with cooling. Um, and again, it's interesting, uh, Zoll Pharmaceutical owns both all of the cooling catheters and, uh, and owns uh, 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 Therox now. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with either comp uh, complementary therapies or not. Uh, this again was a small underpowered, two small underpowered studies by startup companies that ran out of funding. Uh, but what we found with both Cool and ISIT was when we could get the target temperature down to less than 35 degrees, there was a significant reduction of infarct size. Again, retrospective post hoc analysis. Uh, and both of the companies that did this ran out of money. And, and recently, uh, Zoll has, has purchased this. And one of the problems that happened with those early cooling catheters is it took a long time to get the patients to target temperatures. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, the patients were reperfused largely before they were down at target temperature. Uh, Zoll now has a very strong, powerful new cooling catheter that can get patients down to target temperature within nine minutes. And so this is something that I think is also going to be very important and very promising for us to look at. So I would say that this is something to keep an eye on in the future. Uh, they are planning a large uh, a, a pivotal trial in the United States. Uh, they did a pilot in Europe uh, that led to some very uh, conflicting results. And I think that, uh, that we're going to see more from them. So, so keep an eye on, on cooling. I think that's going to be, be very important. And also we're doing a study with, with Abumed, the door to unload trial. I, I think you've seen this before. Uh, there's evidence that, that, with, that when you put an impella catheter in, uh, that actually you can decrease, uh, collateral, you increase collateral flow just alone with the impella catheter. But additionally, there's probably a cardioprotective program. Naveen Kapoor has done an elegant basic science work demonstrating that you can decrease infarct size substantially by opening up a coronary artery 30 minutes after you put an impella in to unload. Uh, this is the data that he presented. It's been published in circulation. 
uh, showing that, uh, that, that overall there was a trend towards this, uh, a reduction of, of uh, infarct area at risk of myocardial salvage. But as the, as the infarcts got larger by the, by the ST segment score, and these are all anterior MIs, as they got larger, uh, there was no difference in infarct size uh, in, the, in, in the impella delay group, and there was a significant in, in increase in infarct size in, in, in the patients that were not uh, delayed with reperfusion. So on the basis of this, now there's a pivotal trial that has started recruitment uh, in anterior MIs. Now the question is, are our operators gonna be interested in putting in a 14 front sheath uh, to put an impella catheter in a patient who is not in shock in anterior MI? And I think that's gonna be probably subjected to how good these, these, uh, these results are. So I'd like to summarize for you that the supersaturated oxygen has been, uh, the, it is the one proven FDA approved strategy to de decrease infarct size. Uh, and there are future potential applications uh, looking at ischemic stroke uh, in oncology, in contrast induced nephropathy and in lower limb ischemia. Uh, we are particularly interested as Greg suggested in cardiogenic shock in the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative uh, we have uh, demonstrated that we can get consistent survival of over 70%, uh, and, but that's still one out of three patients or one out of four patients are still dying in shock. And in order to get this further, we're gonna have to do de something to decrease infarct size. So I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic that co combining primary angioplasty, impella support, and uh, post, post uh, PCI uh, infusion of Therox will be a, a, a really great way. Uh, obviously it needs to be tested but I think that uh, there's a very strong uh, future, especially now that, that, uh, that the Therax has been bought by Zoll. There's ma major uh, commercial involvement now. Uh, they're trying to get uh, an, an added uh, um, uh, marker for CMS so that physicians can be properly re reimbursed for their time. And I think if that happens, uh, you're gonna see a lot more of this. Uh, so I wanna conclude by saying, I think that it's been an amazing uh, journey. Uh, Richard Spears, uh, Kevin Larkin, uh, uh, Richard Schatz, all of you have to be incredibly complimented by uh, your mark dog determination to get this therapy out. Because I do think that there's an enormous amount of promise here now with, that, with, with, with uh, super saturated oxygen. So thanks so much, Raj, and I'd be happy to, to answer questions if there are any. Great, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for the great uh, presentation. Uh, we have a, a couple of uh, uh, questions. Uh, there is one question. Uh, when you start the SSO2 infusion, is there any propensity towards rhythmias? No, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, you have to leave the patient in, this, in the cath lab. I think that's the one downside is that uh, I think it's actually a little unsafe to leave a guiding catheter inside the left vein coronary artery and take them off the table. So I think they, they really should stay on the table so you can watch them. And, and when you watch them, there's really very little arrhythmias. It's, it's really kind of boring. They're, they're really perfectly stable. Um, but you want to be careful with the guide. The one hesitation, again, the one caution I have is you have to make sure that the guide is in a stable position and it's not sort of pushing up against the roof of the left main, which could, could, could cause a potential guide-induced dissection. Oh, that's great. Uh, so we'll have one more question about the stem cell. I think that you know, that question is for Dr. Schatz and I'll ask him after his presentation. So now uh, let's move into the clinical arena uh, of uh, current uh, use of supersaturated oxygen. And Dr. Richard Schatz, who is uh, interventional cardiologist at Scripps Green Hospital in uh, La Waia, has taken a time out of his busy uh, Saturday uh, to be with us. I know he has uh, uh, several things planned today, but uh, was a very, uh, kind enough to uh, make some time for uh, this. Uh, he's well-known interventional cardiologist, uh, well-known from Pama Shack Sense, uh, and uh, he uh, will now talk about uh, clinical experience with supersaturated oxygen. Great, thank you, Raj, and uh, also thanks to all the other participants. Let me share my screen here, see if it comes up. All right, can you see it? Not yet. Oh, okay, uh, hit share screen. All right, sorry about that. 
All right, share screen. Okay, this will, this should work. Yep. All right. We see it now. So okay. if you want a, um, a slideshow, well, mm -hmm. perfect. We got it. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, I'll be I'll be quick here. I've had a very interesting experience with this from the moment I, for my disclosure. So the first time I saw, uh, uh, hang on here, Antonio Bartarelli's uh, data many many years ago, where he showed an increase in the uh, ejection fraction. I was really fascinated with it, and I got involved very early. And I uh, was always very impressed with the science and Richard Spears gets a lot of credit for the brilliant science behind all this. And you've already seen these slides, but this is what really impressed me the most, not only at an anatomical gross level, you can see remarkable reduction in infarct size, but at a cellular level, you've seen these slides already. I think a, a key is at every level of infarction, whether it's edema or um, blood flow, sludging, cellular repair, here's the cell, the pictures you've seen before that uh, SSO2 seems to work at every level, which always meant to me that anything you can do to re reduce the infarct size should definitely improve survival. So I just have a few case studies that to show our experience with it. And uh, here's the very first case. This was a 61 year old gentleman who was golfing out at the Torrey Pines golf course when he had a pretty big infarct. You can see we got to him pretty quick to, you know, in terms of perfusion. But well, you can see a classic infarct here in the anterior circuit distribution. He had a very, very tight lesion in the LAD. He was still symptomatic in the lab, despite he had opened probably with the heparin in the emergency room and got very nice flow, Timmy 3 flow. And more importantly, he had this fairly sizable anterior inferior, anterior apical and inferior infarct, big wraparound LAD ejection fraction was estimated about 35%. Um, here is three days later, pretty impressive. Not everybody does this. I was really surprised when we saw this, but he had remarkable improvement of his STs and actually did not queue out, probably due to the early presentation. So that was really um, impressive to me and clinically did just fine. But more impressive to me was his recovery of LV function. So I remember he started about 35% with a fairly aneurysmal look to the ventricle. Um, there's an MRI that we happened to get at 30 days, but you can see diastole, systole, there's some recovery. Ejection fraction was read out as 45%, and that aneurysmal look at systole is kind of gone. So it's better. It's not completely better, but impressively, two years later, his ejection fraction was almost 60%, and we just happened to get an echo on him uh, two years later in the clinical follow-up, and that his ventricle has recovered entirely, which was really, really surprising. Not sure anybody really knows what the optimum time is to assess LV recovery, but I think it can be as far out as a year and two years. So not terribly discouraged if you see only modest improvements early on. So this was very impressive to me. And we don't have two-year follow-up on everybody that we just have to get it on this guy. There's a similar case. And ironically, this intern and I presented the same day as the other guy. They uh, both, uh, within an hour apart, we had these two anterior infarcts come in. So this looks pretty similar, but this guy was five hours out. He stayed at home a little bit too long. These are all de novo infarcts, by the way. So here's the massive ST elevation, and here's a big stump of the LAD after reperfusion on the right there. You can see there's the stent. This happens to be a bridge down here. Of course, we didn't see until we opened him up, but his LV looked even worse. He had a big, big anterior apical wraparound LAD infarct, and EF was estimated about 30%. And here he is three days post, and the EKG looks more angry, little and evolutionary compared to the last guy. So this doesn't really mean too much, I don't think. Um, it, I think we've learned a lot that we don't really know that much about these patients and time will teach us a lot more about it. But impressive that this guy compared to the other guy, at 30 days, his ejection fraction by MRI was 60%. He had, you couldn't even see a, any area of infarction, which is pretty remarkable, five hours after infarct and then uh, presentation in SSO2. I, th I thought this was absolutely striking. So I put together all of our de novo LAD infarcts. We only, ha we only have a few. We were only involved in the IC hot trial, so we don't have um, a huge experience. But when I put this together, I was really surprised because I went digging to get all the long-term follow-up. It's been four years since we've done some of these. So you can see <clears throat> these are our four patients before at baseline. And each patient, look, if you look individually at each, each of these colors, there's improvement in everybody at a different pace. Some improve really early, some are a little flatter. 
But if you look at the black line, that's the average, which is impressive. The average infarct size early on was in the low 30s. And then at four years, the longest follow-up that we have, we have uh, almost, a, almost a 70% ejection fraction. So I think um, this is probably not everyone's experience. I guess we were just lucky, relatively small, obviously small number of patients, but I was very impressed. Clinically, they all did well, but the recovery of LV function was extraordinary. And if you look at every paper that's ever been written, and Bill can, and Greg can talk about this, you do see, without any intervention other than stenting, you do see, in general, a small increase in infarct size. And I kept track of this over the last 30 years, and EFs run about probably 40% in the big trials, se separating out the shock patients. And you will see an improvement in LV function, and uh, but it's usually in the 2 to 4% range. So you might end up with a 50% ejection fraction um, at 30 days. But I was really impressed to see in all four of our patients to see complete recovery of LV function. I can't explain it other than luck. We did have one patient in the trial whose EF didn't change very much, but he, it turns out, he was not a de novo infarct. He had already had a previous infarct. We didn't know that at the time. Maybe we wouldn't have treated him, um, but there's no way to tell these folks come in. This patient uh, didn't speak English, so we didn't have a lot of history on him and his LV didn't recover. He started about 40%, ended at about 40%, but as we found out, he had infarcted his LAD previously and had stents before. So um, so with all that, uh, I think it's a remarkable experience, skewed, I think, towards good luck because it's a small number. Uh, my impression overall is that SSO2 is very safe. It results in infarct, uh, reduced infarct size, and this should improve ejection fraction and survival. I say it should because we haven't really completely done those studies to prove it, but I'm, I'm almost certain that a large enough trial would show that. Future is very exciting. I think the shock trial looks interesting. The stroke stuff, I think, is interesting. Wound healing. We're very interested in ARDS and COVID patients. We're looking at this right now to see if we can treat some of these patients with SSO2, the ones with the severe hypoxic vasoconstriction and refractory hypoxia. And the other big question is, uh, the, um, is it not just LED infarct? I think it's probably going to work for all big infarcts. I think in the trials, it probably didn't work as well for inferiors because they're relatively small. But if you have a massive right coronary and a non-dominant circumflex, I think you're going to get a benefit from this. So I wouldn't exclude those patients if it's a dominant right. Uh, we have challenges. We're learning, uh, much to my surprise, the reimbursement's a big issue for my our folks. The time in the lab seems to be a problem. Radial versus femoral. Uh, since everybody's gone to radio, I'm getting a lot of pushback at my hospital. I'd, I'd like to hear what the other guys are saying. I can't, haven't had a single, we have about 10 or 20 cardiologists and none of them will use the device for this. Everyone's doing radial. They don't want to stick the femoral artery to get the blood. Uh, so the physician acceptance has been a real, real problem. And I, I think this will be solved by reimbursement and then uh, <clears throat> convincing them that it's okay to do a five French uh, femoral stick. So. With that, I'll end and turn it back to Raj and open up for questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schatz. Uh, one question, that encardiogenic shock patient, would you combine this with uh, stem cell therapy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have a funny slide that says, in an attempt to spend as much money as possible, we'd like to put these people on in, in Pella, then we'll freeze them, we'll I'll give them hypothermia, then we'll give them SSO2 in Pella, and then we'll give them stem cells. So uh, yeah, stem cells don't work right away. They work, uh, it takes a long time for them to work, but there's probably a role for it. The, those studies have been, and we've been involved in every stem cell trial and they, they are encouraging. They show little pings of biologic activity, um, but it'd be a very, very difficult trial to do hard cell. I think there's some benefit to it, but getting the right cell, the right dose and the right patient is always, has always been the issue. And I think we have our hands full looking at shock and impella and SSO2, but great idea. I'd love to do it someday. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shad. So we'll uh, keep continue with the clinical experience uh, with uh, Dr. James Richard Spears uh, from uh, Beaumont uh, in uh, Michigan, uh, who is uh, pioneered uh, some of these concepts. And uh, he's gonna now uh, show his uh, clinical cases.
Raj, I'm going to sign off. I've got a commitment I've got to take off for. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your slides. If you can just go to the uh, slideshow, then okay. I'll just put your slide on the whole screen. Okay, you got that? Okay, great. Okay. Well, well, first I'd like to say it's an incredible privilege to share the, this uh, uh, the, with this panel, this uh, discussion about SSO2. Uh, I, maybe, maybe many people in the audience don't realize that the, those folks sitting on the panel are the ones who moved this technology from bench and animal studies to patients. And, um, and, and of course, Therax and Kevin Mark and they've they, they been working on this for 25 years. And it's, it's, uh, but without these talented uh, clinician researchers, uh, we, none of us would be sitting here. Where, and it was a thrill for me. But I'm going to talk about just a case like, like an ordinary interventional cardiologist when we got uh, the, the equipment at uh, Beaumont Dearborn. Uh, the first case we did um, with PCI and SSO2 was, it was a patient with anterior stem and recurrent VFib, VTAC, uh, cardiac arrest. And the operator was Dr. Severall, and I was called in for the SSO2. Um, Dr. Bernardo was the, a, a fellow in the case. The, the patient was a 53-year-old obese Caucasian male, came with 10 out of 10 crushing chest pain, rating to the left upper extremity. Well, typical in Michigan, shoveling snow at 8 o'clock in the evening. was associated with nausea, sweating. He took two baby aspirin after his wife came home. She drove him to the ED. Uh, he had a past history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, heavy tobacco use. Uh, but he wasn't on any cardiac medications. He didn't, he didn't really trust doctors. There was a history, he either had angiography or angioplasty at Henry Ford 2009, but he was told he didn't have much coronary artery disease. On examining the ED, he was uh, anxious, diaphoretic, pale, and acute distress. He said, I'm having a heart attack. Now, he certainly was right. He was five foot nine, 110 kilos, a little hypertensive. It's sad on nasal O2, it's okay. Um, this, uh, physical findings were kind of minimal, just diminished breast sounds compatible with a COPD. Uh, he just had a two out of six systolic ejection murmur. Extremities were normal. This EKG showed, of course, a big anteroceptal injury pattern with cues already in V1, V2, uh, high STs in one and L and reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. So the STEMI team was activated. He got aspirin, more aspirin, uh, Valenta, IV heparin, nitro and morphine in the ER, uh, x-ray, uh, routine bloods were unremarkable. But on his way to the cath lab, uh, he developed VTAG, VFib, Torsad, and so CPR was started, he was intubated. Uh, in that, that first defibrillation worked, but then he had more, nine more episodes of VTAG, VFib. Uh, until they were able to stabilize him with IV lid lidocaine, magnesium, and amiodarone. He arrived in the cath lab at 10 o'clock, got right ac access in the right femoral artery quickly. Uh, the balloon is in the proximal LED within seven minutes. Uh, but a minute later, he had VTAC VFib again, and that had to be converted to sinus on two occasions before they could put in a stent, a 4 0 by 20 promise at 10.16, gave him a bolus of integral. A minute later, he went into VFib again, it had to be shocked twice. He got additional amiodarone. And LV gram was then done. He had a high EDP. Uh, LVF was estimated at 30 to 40%. Over the next uh, 30 to 60 minutes, he remained kind of hypertensive and that was being treated with nitro, metropolol, and Lasix IV. The SSO2 was started after he was stabilized. So about an, an hour or so after he re established reperfusion. This is done through the 7.5 French sheath and through the sidearm, uh, the, uh, the blood was withdrawn and delivered to the 5 French JL4 impulse catheter 
in the left main. That was, this is the LAO caudal view of the long left main and um, the LED has a cutoff occlusion that, that can be seen a little bit better here in the ARIO caudal. So there's a flush occlusion of the LED. Our wire was passed and with that there is a Timmy one flow then a 2-0 balloon was used to inflate, following which there was some reperfusion that was pretty good. But it was after this first balloon, the first reperfusion that he had another upset of V-tag V-fib and was shocked out of it. So after the 4-0 stent was placed, the Timmy 3 flow looked, uh, looked excellent, uh, but he still had V-tag V-fib shock twice, twice back to normal sinus rhythm. You might notice on this uh, angiogram at the apex, it's dyskinetic, it's, it's dilated and dyskinetic. That's important because the, the, uh, the LV gram was suboptimal because Dr. Sabro was very afraid of inducing another ventricular arrhythmia. So he just did this base injection, but there, there's a whiff of dye that shows, shows you a dilated uh, a kinetic ventricle. The right coronary was, was dominant and it looked uh, normal. This is the console uh, that withdraws the blood uh, through this line from the side arm of the sheath and oxygen is delivered with, I call it aqueous oxygen. It's only three cc's of saline with more oxygen than that delivered into the arterial blood. And this is the SSO2 going back, and a little smaller tube. And it's interesting, when you look at the draw side, this is arterial blood, and the SSO2 side, they look very similar. But if you give a flashlight, you know, flash camera technique, uh, you can see how the hemoglobin brightness, even though the PO2 goes from something like 150 up to 1,000, uh, there's still some increased saturation of the hemoglobin. This is uh, from a lab um, monitoring. If you look at leads one and V1 uh, and AVL, there's extremely high SD segment at, uh, elevation and QAs in V1. And when the SSO2 was finished, the, S the ST segments pretty well normalized. There wasn't much left. The, the Q wave is a little less prominent in V1. But when he, the 12 lead EKG showed, this is that right after the procedure, showed um, almost complete normalization of the STs, but still Q waves in V1, V2, and V3. His hospital course was a little bit complicated. Uh, he went to the ICU stable, but down there at, between three and six o'clock in the morning, he became hypotensive. And it happened in the setting of a failed IJ access attempt and subsequent chest x-ray showed the uh, hemothorax. He dropped his hemoglobin from 14.7 down to 7.4. He did not need a transfusion. He was stable during this period of time. And he was extubated one day later after the hemothorax resolved. His troponin on this follow-up day was 13. It had been 29 to 30. Uh, on three occasions prior to reperfusion. Despite having been on full vent support and almost hemorrhagic shock, uh, he was discharged two days later, full ambulatory, no further events, and his only meds were aspirin, clopidogrel, atorvastatin, carvedilol, and lisinopril. This is his uh, x-ray shortly after his hypotension started where he had a hematoma around the neck. He did have a multinodular goiter, which made access of the IG, IG, IJ kind of difficult. But later when he became shocky, has, uh, he had hit an overt hemothorax. Fortunately, that resolved spontaneously over the next day, which is amazing. We wanted to see how his LV was doing on the day of discharge. We did a DFINITY study, and this is his LV uh, apical view. And 
this is something I don't recall ever seeing in my 50 years of treating large anterior anteroceptal MIs uh, several days after their presentation. It doesn't look like there's, a, there's any hypokinesis, any location. It looks like the wall thickening looks normal everywhere. This is the short axis view. That looks equally good. The reader called the ejection fraction 70%. When he was followed up in the clinic uh, 10 days later, his Q waves had, had disappeared. Even in V1, there's a little R wave. But his EKG looks normal, except it's a minor T wave in, v, in lead one, which is fairly striking. I think we can conclude from that case that that combination of PCI and SSO2 with this large infarct complicated by ventricular arrhythmias, multiple cardiac arrest, requiring defibrillation multiple times, blood loss, need for pressor support, was nevertheless associated with normalization of his echo LV function and disappearance of EKG evidence of an infarction on, on follow-up. He continues to remain asymptomatic and he's been free of any adverse sequelae working as a mechanic post-procedure. Those are the team that uh, there's many people who help make this uh, come about. Uh, our nurses, technicians, Dr. Saberwall and Chuck uh, Lotford from Therox. If, if I can just give you a, a couple minutes of the mechanism. Number one, early reperfusion is uh, essential. It is uh, from symptom onset to reperfusion is about 130 minutes, but also attenuation of reperfusion microvascular ischemia. And most researchers have always referred to it as reperfusion injury without recognizing there's actually persistent ischemia. It's inadequate reperfusion. I, I published a review on this last October, which can, gives you the, uh, a really in-depth uh, analysis of uh, the basic science translation studies and then the clinical review. But basically, schematically, when you have RMI, reperfusion ischemia, at the get-go on reperfusion, if you don't do something about it, you're going to get cellular reactions, edema, inflammation. That'll make that problem worse until you get capillary occlusion. I'd like to show this slide that uh, I, I did the original cartoon, not the final drawing, obviously. But um, I call it the RMI elephant and blinded scientist because in the area of edema that represents the area at risk, there's a, a huge area of edema that is associated with poor red cell flow in many in a patchy way. But a lot of the manifestations of progressive ischemia, like edema and endothelial changes, the spasm, sludging, and apoptosis, shunting, that's not reperfusion injury, that's progressive microvascular ischemia. And even Ischemia is the common substrate for generation of ROS, reactive oxygen species. So if you want to prevent these, you've got to treat the ischemia. This, this, these ideas are not new. Hi, hyperbaric oxygen has, has at least three different FDA approved treatments, uh, skin grafts, red, or crush injuries, carbon monoxide poisoning, randomized double-blinded studies that led to their approval because it works. And I, I certainly wasn't the first one to look at the heart. Uh, Bennett gave a nice review of six small randomized trials in the Cochrane database and showed there was benefit in multiple directions. Just the p-value per mortality is only 0.8. It wasn't powered. We should address for the audience, I think, uh, a lot of confusion arising about oral nasal O2 for patients who have a normal set. The papers suggest that there's harm by giving individual small papers, raise the red flag that's going to cause oxygen radicals. But in fact, the large randomized trials, which are quoted down here, show absolutely no difference between control or high flow oral nasal O2. And why? Because you're trying to deliver high O2 in plasma that can work its way through capillaries that are not produced by red cells. That's the rationale. But you have to use extremely high PO2s to get enough oxygen in the plasma. 
So oral nasal supplementation is not going to work. This conference kind of is nice to kind of, that's the last slide. Grandpa, tell us again the story of what life was like before COVID-19. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Raj. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spears. That was a great case. Um, a couple of questions uh, from the audience about uh, the flow of work uh, in your lab with this uh, uh, device. Uh, can you uh, talk about it a little bit about the, how uh, interventionalists are dealing with this at night? Do they actually stay with the patient or do they leave uh, uh, the patient with the staff and then the staff pulls out the catheter uh, at the end of uh, the infusion? Well, I, w I actually was the one who stayed uh, for, for this case, but uh, we, have a, we have a number of fellows who are, who are eager to stay and, and let the talk to paperwork, talk to the family, whatever, and still be close even if they're on their way out. Uh, I think in the future, it, it's a, it, it, the operator himself, I don't think is I can have to stick around for the whole uh, procedure. Especially during the day, you know, uh, you know, we could probably just work in another room. I, you know, in my lab, we have four labs, so I could probably just go to the uh, lab across and leave the patient on the table. Greg, at, uh, at Columbia, I don't know whether you guys uh, had, or at Sinai, uh, uh, you know, I'm, this is just approved now, so you may not have started this, but you know, we're going to start it very soon. But you know, what protocol have you put in place for you know, how, what to do with the doctor once the catheter's in? Yeah, so I can tell you my recommendation is at, at, at this still relatively early stage, I still think the doctor needs to be in the vicinity. Um, you've got a catheter, you know, sitting in the left main. Um, it's possible you could get a left main plaque or a thrombus. We just don't have thousands of, of patients done yet to know how safe it is. Um, uh, and sometimes you actually have problems with the equipment where you've got to change the cartridge or something like that. And uh, we don't yet know about arrhythmias in this early period. So until we get a lot more data, um, I think the, the, doctor it's only 60 minutes it's not a huge amount of time so i do think the doctor should remain there probably doesn't have to be scrubbed but probably somebody should be scrubbed in case somebody needs to rapidly pull the catheter out of the left main that would be the first thing you do if you suspected any trouble just pull the catheter out of the left main um interrupt the uh, infusion see what's going on and you can always restart the infusion but at this point i think uh, we shouldn't be cavalier and we should be available what do you, um, uh, Dr. Spears, the other question was that what is the ACT uh, should be during this infusion? Well, you know, this is a bypass circuit. So, you know, we tell the docs it should be over 300, and I, I like unfractionated heparin. Uh, but if you, if you look at the surgical folks and perfusionists, they, they really like their ACTs closer to 400. So if it's at 350, I'm actually pretty happy, but um, definitely over 300. But there's, there's, there's very little data on this. Anticoagulated, basically. Uh, one more question has been, uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Rangasetti uh, says he does radial PCI with five and a six French slender sheet. Uh, can we do SSO2 with a five French diagnostic catheter through this radial sheet? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it, all it needs is a five French. We're using a Boston Impulse catheter, but uh, it, any five French sheath will allow you to actually do the procedure. The, you do have to have a source of arterial blood someplace else though. So right. you know, some folks are toying with putting a sheath in the contralateral radial, or I'm encouraging Therax to go down to a four French sheath. You know, not much different than just doing an arterial monitoring line in the ICU. A little, I, I think it could easily handle the 100 cc's of flow on the dry side. Right. So you would, you would really need a, a, a real six French sheath in the radial if you're going to use just the radial access site. So a five French, you know, Boston Scientific Impulse catheter, that's what it's approved for, which is a low OD catheter um, and a high ID catheter for the infusion rate, but then at least a six French radial sheath. Otherwise, you've got to use the a draw sheath 
either in the other radial artery or in a femoral artery. I see. Yeah. No, that's a great, great suggestion. Um, Mike, there was a question earlier about uh, what's your uh, recommendation currently about post dilatation of uh, stents post STEMI given the uh, risk of embolization? Well, I think one of the problems is you often have a lot of vasoconstriction or a lot of tone in the setting of STEMI. So uh, when you're talking about the right size of the artery, it's important to give some vasodilator, I think, to see what the true size of the artery is. And then um, I do go up routinely to 18 amps, uh, make sure we're adequately sized. Many members of our group uh, use a lot of imaging. Uh, I would say maybe 30% of cases last week, the number was where they're using either IVUS or OCT uh, to make sure that you're well opposed. Uh, so that's another uh, you know, thing that some labs may do. Uh, but I believe in direct stenting and then high pressure inflations and uh, making sure you're matched with vasodilation to the segment. Thank you. Uh, so the last comment here is from Dr. Hailan from Morristown Cardiac Center, congratulating uh, Dr. Stone for impressive outcome of the 100 patients and that they would like to participate in your follow-up uh, future studies. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank uh, all the panel members. Uh, what a great uh, session, uh, incredible uh, lectures and uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, uh, current and future application of this very exciting uh, technology and, and future clinical trials. So I thank everyone uh, and uh, you all have a great uh, weekend and thank you uh, for joining us. Great. My Thank pleasure. You for putting this together. Thanks, Ross, for having us. Congratulations, Greg. Thanks, Thank everybody. Have a great week. Everyone did Thanks, a great Greg. job. Great. Thank you so much.